Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And I'm really excited for today's guest because in a lot of ways, he is like our doppelganger, uh, especially in his philosophy of life. But I'd be remiss if we didn't really properly introduce my co-host. You know him. You love him. Six Sigma, the professor, the brain, Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmodo.com. And most importantly, if not automating your Craigslist and your Facebook postings, postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. Scott Todd, how are you? Mark, I'm great. How are you? Post normal. Respiration's fine. Um, I'm excited to talk to the landlord coach, Mark Dolfini. If you don't know about Mark, he is the author of The Time Wealthy Investor and a veteran of the U.S. Marines. I was going to mess with him, Scott, but not anymore. Yeah, don't mess uh, with a Marine, man. Don't mess with him. Yeah, yeah, he owns several millions out, million dollars worth of real estate. He's been actively managing over $40 million of real estate since, uh, in, in, since being in business for about 20 years. And he's got this very interesting philosophy that, I know Scott is going to make you uh, very happy. And that is that true wealth is not the simple accumulation of personal wealth. It is the pinnacle wealth is time wealth, the ability to control your calendar. And we're all about that, Mark Dolfini. Welcome. Well, it's good to be here. Thanks so much for having me. So Mark, before you became, you know, the landlord coach, Let's just rewind the tape and walk us through your journey and how you, how you started out. Sure. Well, um, as you mentioned, I was, uh, I was, I was, I'm a Marine, um, still a Marine, just not on payroll anymore. But uh, I sure. spent four years uh, flying around to different countries and uh, I was a navigator on C-130s and I, uh, it was a great time for me. It was, a, it was good for me, but I knew that I wanted to get out. Uh, pursue things more entrepreneurial and get an education and, and start down that path um, down down the business into the business world. So I uh, got accepted to Purdue. I got a degree in accounting with a minor in finance. And uh, when I arrived in Lafayette, Indiana, a, about a year later, I I knew that I, I I had an interest in real estate. I always that the concept of ownership of real estate was always something that was very interesting to me. So I started down that path and. Um, I started buying rental properties when I was in, when I, when I got in my first year in school. And uh, by the time I had finished up my four year, the four years at Purdue, I had about a dozen rental units about, which amounted to about a half million dollars worth of real estate. Um, and uh, that's when things really started to get interesting. And that's really where I started making a lot of mistakes. <laughs> so that's really where my education started. Yeah. I mean, Mark, I hope, this podcast isn't going to go sideways now because I'm a IU grad. <laughs> I have to tell you, I think I'm literally the worst Purdue alumni ever. I, I, I having been in the, the, uh, the Marine Corps for four years and then, then going to Purdue, I, I, I honestly, I, I didn't recognize why everybody was wearing gold and black at the at commencement. So I, I think you're safe. <laughs> all right. All right. That's good. That's good. So, you started out really, really young, and then you started making mistakes. What were some of your favorite mistakes that you like to brag about? So, <laughs> yeah, it, it's funny when people come to me, as, whether as a coaching client or even just needing a, a minute's worth of advice, they usually say, ah, I, I knew I, this was a mistake, and I just I did this. And, and I usually can put them at ease pretty quickly because that's a one-upmanship game that I can usually win. I made way worse mistakes than most people, um, but uh, and and really costly mistakes at times. But but probably the, the the biggest thing first and foremost was I was really I was doing a lot of the the work and was not um, and was not ever. Um, I was never get, working into a place where I could get myself out of that position, get where I was just got myself on the hamster wheel and I was doing all the, 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 the showings, the, the, uh, the listings of the, of the, um, the advertising, the marketing, the properties, like I said, doing all the showings, 
doing all the painting, the cleaning, the rent collections, the lease signings, filing for evictions. I mean, on and on and on every aspect of the business, I was doing it. And, um, you know, when you have half a dozen units or a dozen units, it's not that big of a deal, especially if you're single. But as I was scaling up and got to 30, 40, and at the pinnacle, I was at 92 rental units. That was $6 million worth of real estate I had coming in, um, $65,000 a month in revenues. Um, but it was all built on a house of cards. And it was because I never treated what I was doing like a business. Yeah, Scott Todd, what are your thoughts? It, it is amazing that, uh, you know, like people, you just start going through things. And what people don't realize about real estate investing is in fact, like it is, to me, it's a lot different than like being any other type of investor because any other type of investor I can go, I can buy stocks in a company and that's it, right? It's, it's done for me, it's, it's managed. And I think what people sometimes, when they enter real estate investing, what they don't think about is, man, I'm not just an investor. <clears throat> I am creating my own business, right? Like real estate investing is a business that I don't think that a lot of people else would, would kind of check that in. Yeah, absolutely. And I, Mark, I would say I was very guilty of, of what you're describing. I mean, but my niche was a lot simpler, but in the beginning, I don't even think I was thinking entrepreneurial. I don't even think I was thinking about systems or processes or automation or delegation with anything. I just thought, well, this is fun. I, I'm buying land, 25, 30 cents a dollar, flipping it. And I'm making a 300% return on my money. What, what could go wrong? Right? Right. right exactly. Yeah, so and that's, what, was the, what was, do you remember the, the, the critical breaking point for you that said, okay, I got to really start treating this like a business. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of hard for, to forget because I almost died. I mean, literally, I almost died. I was, um, I remember this very, very well. I, um, there I was, I was, I was making, um, uh, you know, roughly, like I said, $65,000 a month in revenues were coming in. I was working 17 to 20 hour days, uh, seven days a week. I'd never, I never put myself in a position where I could ever, uh, you know, where someone else could ever do the work, where I could ever turn it over to someone else. And um, so 2008 came along and uh, shook up the snow globe for many of us that were in the business at, at that time. And I mean, it, it, 2008 just sped up what was inevitably going to happen with me because this house of cards that I had built, it just, it was all based on one single point of failure, which was me. Everything ran through me. And that was just, it was, it was unscalable. It was unsustainable. And uh, finally, um, what, what started out as a, as a simple cold turned into double pneumonia. And, uh, you know, cause I was working as, as things got bad, you know, things went from $65,000 a month in revenues to $30,000 a month in revenues. You know, I couldn't withstand that storm. So I, I worked harder. I worked more hours, um, just trying to keep everything afloat and keeping, you know, keeping all my fingers in the dikes so it wouldn't, uh, so it wouldn't spill over, but it was, it was unsustainable. So at that point, my three day vacation in the hospital, um, where I did, I had came down with double pneumonia and, and I almost died in the triage room and they finally got me pumped back up and, and, and back to life. But, uh, I knew that I could not continue in this madness that I had to set, I had to do something different. What was work, what I had going was not working and I needed to get something in place that was operating much more like a business and much more scalable. Yeah, I mean, that, that'll do it. So I can imagine that being a Marine and what that takes and the discipline and, and all of that, it had to be somewhat difficult for you to start letting go and building this team. Do you remember what that transition looked like for you and hiring just the first person and letting go of that first piece of the business? So um, for those of you who are visual out there, if you can think of like when the, the, you know, in the Marvel fans, perhaps, you know, it's like watching the Hulk turn back into David Banner. That's what it was like for me. <laughs> so it was this awkward, weird, like I woke up with pants that didn't fit, you know, it's just weird. Right. Um, but, it, but kidding aside, it was, it was very, very difficult because I didn't, what I recognize is that 
it, it, my problem wasn't that I didn't, I wasn't working hard enough. And that's a lot of problem with a lot of people, especially entrepreneurs, especially veterans. Um, you know, we have a good work ethic and many entrepreneurs out there have a good work ethic, but, be, but they, I made the fundamental mistake that just because I had a good work ethic did not mean that I should be doing all the work. So trying to translate that over into, you know, going from self-employed to business owner was a very awkward and difficult time for me because I didn't know what to turn over. You know, me hiring somebody and then throwing them in a room and yelling, do work was not going to improve the, the, the world, you know, my world, um, you know, in the state of things. So it was really difficult to, to start turning those things over. So really I started turning over to automation first um, and, and just some very, very small things, some small ideas, which bought me back some, some bits of time. Uh, just as a quick example, um, one of the things that I did was I started automating my, uh, my, my calls as they came in. I, I actually set up a call tree for people who, if they had a question, you know, if they wanted um, a, uh, information on a particular property, they could call in to a toll-free number, hit that number, you know, number one or two or whatever it was based on the description, and then they would hear a full two or three minute description of the property, you know, what the, what the rent was, what the security deposit was, what my pet policies were, et cetera, et cetera. And then if they were interested, they could hit zero and then it would dial directly to me. And at that point I had a fully vetted and interested party on the line. I didn't have to go through that 15 or 20 minute conversation about, you know, about the property that I, that I'd already listed in the ad that I had already said, you know, maybe, um, you know, I wouldn't have to repeat myself too many times. A lot of times it was people just going, yes, I, I'm ready to see this property. So I might have to ask them a question or two saying, okay, are you looking to move in right away? This property is ready right away. It's not, it's not ready. You know, if it's April, I'm not going to hold it up until November. You know, like just a couple of questions like that, make sure all the decision makers were going to be there and then set the appointment. So that alone saved me. And again, at that time I was at, you know, 90 plus properties, 92 properties. That's, that alone saved me probably two to three hours per day. Just, just by putting that, that, that in place. Um, and I might have to do it like an hour every two weeks to update the, the, the call tree, but something like that, that automation set me up for hours and hours of dividends every single week. Yeah, I love it. I mean, Scott, Todd, do you remember the, the first piece of outsourcing for you that was most difficult? Well, uh, what, what happened was the first thing that I outsourced was, um, kind of list scrubbing mark. So essentially I had sat there for 21 days and was scrubbing my own list to, to mail. And I'm like, man, this is absolutely for the birds, man. Like who, who I'm never going to be able to do this business because I can't stand this one thing. So that's where I'm like, okay, I'm going to get somebody else to go do it. I, I, I was kind of, I wasn't necessarily nervous because I had built teams at work. You know, like I, I had teams of people that work for me. So it wasn't necessarily like, oh, this is, um, yeah. what I didn't know is I didn't know what to expect with working with a VA on the other side of the globe. And so, you know, re really what happened was they did a great job. I mean, I cr created a training video, invested time to, to, to work with them on it. Next thing you know, the work that was taking me, let's say, uh, let's say 10 hours a week to do, they were getting it done in, in like three hours a week for $3 an hour. So all of a sudden I realized like, man, I'm sitting there and I'm making like chump change of my time when in fact I could get somebody else to go do it. So there is a mindset shift that goes in there. Like, okay, I, I was, I was nervous about spending $9 a week. Then all of a sudden you're like, that's the greatest $9 I've ever spent in my life. Yeah. Yeah. But I can, I can imagine for Mark though, like what you were bringing up as far as the Hulk, you know, sort of like this, this, this superhero syndrome, because when you're doing something so often and so successfully, you could make the argument, well, no one's going to be able to do this as well as me. And so how was it handling frustration tolerance as you went from automation into like delegation and, and actually working with human beings? So one of the things that I had to, and, and to Scott's point, that's an excellent example. I'd love to, you know, tie into that a little bit. So, you know, what I did was I had to recognize what my time was actually worth, even though I was working 18 hour days, including travel and everything else. And, um, and then I was still doing a side hustle job here and there. I, I, like I said, I have a background in accounting. So, um, 
I was, I was working kind of like as a temp in different areas if the, if the job paid well enough. But I mean, I was doing everything I could to hustle. And that was really part of the problem is that, you know, a lot of real estate investors get addicted to the hustle. And you have to get out of that. Otherwise, you just never, I mean, it's always going to be this for you. And man, there's just more to, so much more to life than just the deal. Even though it's exciting in the beginning, man, I did not get into this job because I just had so much abundance of free time that I never wanted to see my friends. I never wanted to spend time with my family or do even do the things that excite me. You know, I was just doing it all for the wrong reasons. So one of the things though, to, to, to that, that, that mental shift for me was realizing that when I was doing a job that I could pay someone else to do cheaper, that's what I was paying myself. So if my job, if my time amortized, you know, over the course of a year, if I made a hundred grand, amortize that out. And if I was worth $50 an hour based on the number of hours that I was working for me to do a 10 or $12 an hour job, or even a $3 an hour job for me to do that, I was costing myself 40 to 50 to 40 to $47 an hour to do that work. That's what it was costing me. So once I shifted my mindset to what it was costing me, then, then I realized I really need to start handing some of this stuff over, especially the stuff that was of, of little consequence if it wasn't done right, like the painting and the cleaning and stuff like that. I mean, yes, yeah, that's absolutely important. It's delivery of the product, but that's the sort of stuff that you, you, bake in the cake and say, okay, well, I can, I can set aside 20 minutes to go check on the work and make sure it's done versus spending eight hours to do it, which is going to take me probably twice as long than a professional painter. And, and you know, when, even if their rate, even if their billing rate was 20 to $25 an hour, it's still less than what, what, what my billing rate was worth at the time. So that mindset really, that, that paradigm really helped me shift my mindset to uh, getting the lower end tasks handed over to someone else. Yeah. I mean, see, Scott, you can see why you know, I refer to Mark as our doppelganger. Right, right. <laughs> with you. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, Mark, we are, we're always saying, you know, we can always make more money, but we can't get more time. And so Scott and I will literally do like anything, like we'll buy any app or software or tool that will literally buy us more time, like anything. Um, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But when you are, when you have that sort of, lens and that total clarity, you know, A, what's my time worth? And then B, um, what am I doing? It, the world becomes very different. And, and the way you look at things becomes very different. So we're 90% automated now between software systems and, and virtual assistants. Um, where are you at as far as um, your automation and, and, and uh, involvement in the business? In, the, in my management business, um, I spend about two hours a week personally. Um, and it's about 250 units altogether. So I can't say it's spent an abundance of time. I mean, I spend more if it's, if I'm needed, but I need to let my people do what they do. Um, we have a virtual assistant that answers the phone overnight. Um, you know, back some backup calls, but I mean, it's, it's, you know, a lot of that stuff is really because I took a lot of time to get very serious about how the, 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 the VIP paradigm, the, how I set up my business and what I coach others. So it's, it really takes, um, it really takes a uh, very deliberate action to, uh, to really set that up as a business. So you're not distracted by, oh, hey, I want to go do that flip, even though my infrastructure doesn't support me doing a lot of flips, or I want to do that full rehab when my infrastructure doesn't support me doing a full rehab. Right. So I really, it, that's where, that's why in the VIP paradigm I'm, I'm alluding to is called vision infrastructure process. And that's the road that I bring people down when, when I'm helping them set up their business and setting it up as a business. All right. So let's pick on Scott. He calls you up and says, Mark, I'm going to buy this, uh, this small, you know, four person duplex. Right. Right. Um, how would you coach him? And he's like, I want to do it all myself too. I'm going to, I'm going to buy it. I'm going to fix it up. Um, and I'm going to rent it. Okay. So generally let's it probably to answer that question would probably maybe just explain the VIP paradigm just a little bit. So the, if, if Scott and I were working together, for example, you know, one of the things, the first thing that we're going to talk about is his vision, the V of the VIP paradigm. 
And that vision is so incredibly important because it's, it really is the target that you're aiming at. And if, if you are aiming at nothing, I promise you, you're going to hit nothing, right? You, you're, it, it, the arrow can go anywhere. But with a vision that is absolutely, and it's, it's so clear that it's almost obvious. I, I use this example in terms of vision. You know, when, when your vision is clear, it is absolutely obvious, right? So what is probably the most dangerous place to be in the world? I would argue it's probably between a mother and her child, right? Sure. And that's because a mother has a, an abundantly clear vision, especially good moms. They have a good, absolutely clear vision for their child growing up healthy and happy and, and being, in a, being in a good place, right? That, that, that mother is going to protect that child. And, that, and that they will, that, that's where the term mama bear comes from, right? That's where you do not, you're not going to get between a mother and her cub. You're not, you're not just like a mother and her child. So because their vision is absolutely clear on raising that child. Now, I'm not saying that there's not bad moms out there that, they, that get distracted on their own, their own thing. But moms, you know, pick up cars and, 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 uh, and, and fight off attackers much larger than them because they have an absolutely clear vision of the future for their, for the, the, uh, for their offspring. So in, in that particular case, I mean, that, that raising that child is so visceral. That's what your vision needs to be. That, that it just needs to be absolutely clear. And on most people's vision, that's where, that's where most of this falls apart because they, have, they, they easily get distracted by, oh, I'm a buy and hold guy, but I'm going to go do a flip once in a while or maybe I'm going to go buy a note. You know, oh, hey, I'm going to take, you know, I mean, it's okay to educate yourself, but the problem is it's very easy in this, in this realm to get very distracted. But if you have an absolutely clear vision for your future, it becomes less and less uh, of a distraction where you, where, when, when other opportunities come up, you could say, Hey, is this in alignment with my vision? And sometimes you need a coach to do that. I'm not saying me, I'm just saying a coach to do that, to say, Hey, I need someone to hold me accountable to make sure I'm not wandering off the path too easy. Cause again, it's very easy. Even I have coaches and to, to you know, I have different coaches for different areas of, of my business that I, I need to make sure that that stays clear. So vision is really, it is absolutely that important. And the reason that vision is so important is because the next piece is infrastructure. So infrastructure is the bones of your business. It's the, it's the website, it's the, it's the, the, the software, the, um, the, uh, the uh, computer systems, you know, laptops, software, desk chairs, even if you have an office, that's all infrastructure, okay? So if, the reason we go to infrastructure next, next is because if your vision, for example, is to say you want to spend six weeks vacationing with your family, then, you know, you know, you want to spend six weeks vacation with your family somewhere on a beach. Well, if your infrastructure is set up to where you need to re be returning emails and phone calls in a timely manner, that's not going to work out well for you at all. If your vision is to sit on the beach with your family for six weeks, right? So th that all has to be in alignment. And then finally, there's process. So up to this point, if you think of, you know, of the vision as the map, if you will, and infrastructure is the train tracks. That's the bedrock. That's the train tracks of your business. The process would be the train. That's what the train that runs on the track. So the process is the system, is the, is the system. It's the rules upon which you'll operate. It's the, uh, the, just basically the rules of engagement. It's your FAQ. It's your SOP. It's all the things that you do that runs on that infrastructure. And all of that stays in alignment with your vision for the future. All right. I love it. Scott Todd. I mean, uh, how, how, can you, how can you argue with any system? Like, you know, that's the thing is that there's a system in place for it. It's a methodical method. Makes sense to me. Yeah, no, and I, I love that he starts with the vision as well. And um, because I think so often we get so, you know, caught up in the latest tactic, right? Um, and you really need to rewind more and, and do some more serious soul searching like, what do you really want? And then it's much more easy to, you know, try different tactics. But if your vision or your purpose or your why isn't totally clear, well, it's really easy to, to get just distracted on, you know, the, the whatever. The minutia. On. Yeah. The, minutia. The, the nonsense that will fill your day, especially, 
you know, people will come and they'll complain about the residents, you know, they're doing this and that. And what a lot of times what I'll say to them is, all right, look, think, think of your business as a vessel, right? So if you're thinking of your business as a vessel, think of it as a canoe. And if your vision is to get downstream, a canoe is a good vessel for that. If, however, your vision is to get to the top of a mountain, I suppose you could drag a canoe to the top of a mountain, right? <laughs> but it's not going to be very effective, very efficient, and certainly not very enjoyable. So if I've done my job well, I've set up a business that, that's got the three E's involved. It's efficient, effective, and enjoyable. So when, when if you're looking at your business, not as an, an end in and of itself, where people go, I, I want 100 rental units, and I'm like, why would you want to deal with all of that? Like, what, what's your vision for that? Because not saying that that's wrong, but why do you need a vision that's going to, why do you need a business that's going to produce that amount of management? Uh, you know, what is it that about a hundred? And why not 99? Why not 101? Why a hundred? And it's usually some nonsensical, well, it's a good round number, right? But it's really, it's really because they don't have a really clear vision for what they want. And that's why it's so easy to get distracted. I mean, that, that is in fact, one of the hardest things to do is to give yourself a vision and know exactly what you want because sometimes you like like what i notice about people is that sometimes what happens is that like they they they'll say like okay like i i want you know i want to be on the beach like i i just want to be able to quit my job and just relax okay great well let's put a number to that oh and then they go very very conservative because they don't want to seem like nutty and then at the same time in their minds, they can't even fathom that they can achieve the number that they want. So they put this number out there. Uh, uh, okay, I'm uh, ten ten thousand uh, dollars. Why ten thousand dollars? Oh, that's what I need to pay my bills. Okay, ten thousand dollars a month. You pay your bills that way. Cool, no problem. Now, now you're happy. But then it's like, well, why not fifty? Well, is fifty even possible? Well, isn't any number possible? But you have to believe deep down inside that you can achieve that number. And I think that sometimes people just don't want to give themselves permission to even dream. Right, absolutely. And, and, and a lot of times the vision, I mean, I, I have to, this, this whole thing is a battlefield of the mind. It's, it's, and it's really about changing mindset. You know, for example, what you talked about is, you know, when you say, you know, put it together what you want and you said, you know, they want to quit their job. Okay. So that's a list of something that they don't want. They don't want a job. They don't want, you know, they don't want to have to answer to somebody. They don't like, they put this list of together of all the things that they don't want. And that's, that's a good first step, but you can't stop there because the problem is it, it's like going, having a list like that is like going to the supermarket with a list of all the things that you don't want to buy. So if you go to a list, if you go to the supermarket with a list of bread, milk, and eggs, guess what you're going to see? <laughs> you're going to see bread, milk, and eggs for days. And that's the problem. So you can't have a list of all the things that you don't want. It's a good place to start. Don't get me wrong. But you really need to be able, and, and it's really hard to self-prescribe this. Again, like I said, this is why I have coaches to help me make sure that I don't get too far off the, my, my, away from my own vision. But, you know, and, and, and if that, that coach doesn't hold me accountable, I get another coach because I need them to hold me accountable to that if I start wandering off too far. But that's where somebody who can really get into the, into the thick of it with you and say, wait a minute, hold on a second. You know, Scott, why are you, why are you wandering down that path? That's away from your vision. You know, are you, are you not serious about this vision anymore? Because if you're not, then that's fine. But we need to sit down and do some vision work. We need to sit down and really talk about what this vision thing is. And I know this may sound really hokey to some, some people out there, especially some younger people, because I'll tell you what, the 24 year, old, 24 year old version of me would not have heard any of this. But I'm telling you that right now, if you're, especially if you're younger, you think time is abundant until you start having some loss in your life. And that's when people, you know, especially someone that's close to you, you realize that we only get so many spins on this rock and you're not put here to toil and, and, and be, uh, be at the servitude of others, but rather you serve a higher purpose. And whatever that purpose is, is up to you to define. 
And, and most of the real estate investors I talk with, man, they've got some amazing, amazing visions for their future, like digging wells in Kenya. And, and, you know, and maybe it's not even about them. It's just, you know, giving back to their communities and whatever it is. But it, maybe they have some, you know, they, they want to drive a Lamborghini because it's a cool car. But, you, you know, once you get past all that stuff, then you realize like, man, I can really make a big impact in this world and make it truly a much better place. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, you know, speaking of accountability, today's podcast is sponsored by Flight School. To learn more about how to make, how Scott Todd's going to make you accountable in real time with your class, he's going to make you mail, he's going to make you market, he's going to watch you and force you in, <laughs> to execute in 14 weeks. Go to landgeek.com forward slash training, schedule a call with the Zen Master, Mike Zeno, or the Nightcap Meister, Scott Bossman, and learn more about flight school. So Mark, I think your mentorship has been uh, phenomenal on this podcast. And we're going to ask you for one more tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something actionable where the art of passive income listeners can go right now, improve their businesses, improve their lives. What have you got? Well, probably the biggest thing that I could say is put a value on your time. And I know that sounds really vague right now, but really go through the exercise. If you're working a job, I want you to take from the moment you wake up, you know, and, and start to devote your time to that job. And that includes travel, right? So if you're traveling, now we all need to get up and shower. We all appreciate that. Um, but I mean, take the time out of that, your travel time and all that stuff that you're, if you're working a job, amortize that out and find out what your true worth is per hour. And if, you're, if you've got some rentals on the side or if you're doing real estate full time, find out what, you're, what, what, you, know, what you made per hour and d d uh, you know, in the year and divide that out for the rough number of hours, but come up with a number and really start to get very intentional about the things that you are doing that are the highest and best use of your time. If you're a deal maker, that's great. Stick with deal making and, and stop doing all the stuff that you know, if you're spending four, five, six hours a day on email, you know, is that really generating uh, wealth for you? And is it generating time wealth for you where you have the ability to control your calendar? So really challenge the people out there to, um, to make sure that you're valuing your time and you're learning about your time and make it the highest and best use of your activity. I love it. Scott Todd, what's your tip of the week? Mark, have you ever seen, uh, you've seen a movie, I know, and you, you look at the movie and you're like, man, the, the video quality of that movie is beautiful, right? Like it, there's a big difference between like the video quality in a movie and I don't know what I can throw off on my iPhone, right? Like it, there's a difference. Sure. But I got to tell you about this app I just downloaded today. It's at Nizo.co. Here, I'm going to put it in the chat for you too. Nizo.co. And uh, the cool thing about this app, it's in the chat. The cool thing about this app is that basically what it does is it brings out the cinematic effects that you would normally see in a movie, delivers it right to my iPhone so I can create like good looking video. It's going to look like a movie. It's beautiful. Oh, I'm getting this right now. $4.99. I love it. Four ninety nine. Wow, it's got a lot of good reviews too. Yeah, it's really good. This app is only available on the App Store. All right, so I got to buy it. Um, <laughs> Nizo, I love it. Nizo.co. Look at just even go to the, that website, and they got some just beautiful like um, videos, like movies, like little mini, mini movies or whatever. I mean, really good stuff. All right, I'm getting it right now. My tip of the week is learn more about Mark Dolfini and, you know, just, just another uh, really, um, really, I think, important mentor for all of us to, to put that lens on in our lives that life is short. And here's somebody that um, isn't all about, you know, get yourself you know, the million dollar home and the, uh, you know, the beach house in Maui, but really dig deep, find out what's really important to you and then create the, you know, once you have that vision, then create the steps and the processes to go ahead and execute on it. Um, learn more, go to landlordcoach.com.
landlordcoach.com. We'll have a link to it, landlordcoach.com. And if you want to get the free book that he's offering us, go to landlordcoach.com forward slash land geek. And we'll have a link to that as well. Mark Delfini, are we good? We are awesome. You guys are, uh, it sounds like we, we are brothers from another mother. It, it's amazing. I really enjoy hearing that there's other people that, that, um, that follow the same paradigm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Scott Todd, how, how many hours did you work in your land business this month? Uh, I, worked, I work on average about two hours a week in my land business. Okay. That's awesome. I think, I'm, I, I think I'm less. You might be less. <laughs> I'm a little less. I mean, but it, you know, it becomes the point like in time, like I'll say to my wife, I'm like, well, why, why am I going to circle around the, the mall now look for a parking spot? I'm like, life is short. Let's just valet. Like, <laughs> like, like anything I can do to save time. It's getting insane. Um, <laughs> but it's true. Um, Anyways, I want to thank all the listeners. The only way, the only way we're going to get the quality of guests like a Mark Dolfini is if you do us three little favors. You got to subscribe, you got to rate, you got to review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of that review to support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you for free the $97 passive income launch kit. And um, Scott, are you ready? We are, Mark. Ready? One, two, three. Let freedom, freedom ring. <laughs> All right. Mark's like, boy, they are geeky. <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, uh, thanks, Mark. And uh, we'll see everybody next time.